Hello and welcome back to Book and Page. We are continuing the grand adventure through Beowulf. And we're gonna kill our first monster today. Woo! And then do a whole lot more talking. Because obviously at this point. Obviously. So why don't we hurry up, do our quick review of what happened during this section, and move right on to talking about things in a little more depth. So, things that happened. Well, we left Beowulf and Grendel in a death throes match where they're grappling with each other. Now, Beowulf's men are concerned about him. Don't forget we have 14 others who have come on this journey and they really want to protect their liege lord. So they've drawn their swords, they're ready to fight. But it turns out what they don't know has actually saved Beowulf. It turns out swords cannot damage Grendel, and Beowulf is able to win this fight through the fact that he actually fought Grendel hand to hand. And it's a good thing too that Beowulf is also, you know, good at this. Because he ultimately defeats Grendel in hand-to-hand -hand combat by tearing off Grendel's arm. Yeah, the entire thing, just at his shoulder, just <laughs> And Grendel flees back into the fens to ultimately die. Um, this is kind of confirmed by the men of Herat who follow the sort of gory trail and find this monster pond with a lot of blood in it. And uh, they're very happy because Grendel's dead and his arm is now displayed in Herat. Uh, because Beowulf kept a hold of it. Now, in celebration, several things happen. The story of Sigmund is actually recited, and by giving the story of another famous monster killer, Beowulf is being complimented here indirectly. He's basically being compared to Sigmund in a positive way. But the story also does contain a comparison to a bad hero in King. And then, well, Rothgar gives thanks to God and takes Beowulf in as a son. They then repair the hall and start a good deal of feasting, where Beowulf, of course, recounts his battle with Grendel and the grappling and is showered with gifts. Yeah, uh, the, the, the action here seems to be pretty roller coastery. But I do find there are a couple of very interesting things that we can actually pick out here, especially if Beowulf is a reread for you. Some of these things are going to slip past you if you don't know the ending of the tale. The other thing to keep in mind is we also don't know the full context of this. Likely this was an oral tale that's now been written down and, well, we don't understand all the references. While we do know of Sigmund and his adventures, we don't always know the same versions. For example, in this one, there is actually a reference to his nephew, <laughs> who in the tale that we have now is in fact Sigmund's son with his own sister. So both his son and nephew. Now. The footnote in here does say it could possibly be that the narrator is, well, trying to be subtle about that point, or maybe he does in fact have a different version of the tale than we do. And we know, again, especially with oral tales, that this can happen. But there's context that's referred to that we've definitely lost in the past. There are a couple points throughout this tale where the narrator is kind of assuming that you're an audience that knows what's going on. And unfortunately, we don't always know what's going on, at least not clearly. For example, there has been quite a bit of foreshadowing, and it comes up here again, that Herat is safe for now, but will not be safe in the future. Which is to say that infighting is ultimately going to destroy the place. The bit we get in this section Do, do, do. 
Hereout within was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Scaldlings plot at the time. At the time is a unique set of words there, which is to say that plotting is going to occur at some point, and it could lead to the ultimate downfall of the kingdom and the king's family. Now, there is some belief that Herod's nephew ends up taking the throne and not his son, and this might be what's being referred to, but until we get a concrete version of the tale, well, we can only really speculate what's being referred to here. It's just assuming that the audience knows about this. And in that way, we are actually building tension, just like last time when we were talking about the fact that while Grendel is stalking the hall, we're told that he's not going to live. Well, that builds tension. It's referring to an event that we know is going to have happen. It's just a question of when. Grendel's happened immediately, but something like this could be coming much further in advance, especially since it's not happening at this time. There is a break in between now and then. And in truth, it makes the piece feel a little less worth all the bloodshed when you kind of know it's just going to happen again. It is a cycle. But this part of the story is directly referring to cycles. That's why we actually get a story within the story. Sigmund is brought up as a monster slayer just like Beowulf. History is repeating itself and Beowulf is coming into his own as his own monster slayer. But we do have a direct reference here, which is Sigmund's destruction of a dragon, which, again, in versions of the tale, is not Sigmund, it's actually his son. But having the connection here is important, because Beowulf, spoiler alert, at the end of this story, will go on to fight a dragon. So we're getting a reference to the fact that, like the previous dragon slayer, Beowulf will become one as well. But he's not allowed to rest on his laurels here. If we wanted just a purely good comparison, then the accounts would have stopped there. But the account of Sigmund is actually paired with the account of a bad king. A tyrannical king. Who ultimately destroyed the Danes, or at least left them in very desperate straits. That is to say... Hermond. You see, Hermond seized his might and valor, and among the jutes he was betrayed into his enemy's hands and quickly dispatched. The surging of cares that had crippled him too long, he had become a deadly burden to his own people. To all noblemen, for many a wise man had mourned in earlier times over his headstrong ways. Well, headstrong is perhaps exactly the term we can use when referring to Beowulf, can't we? Especially since he decided to fight a monster alone hand to hand. And we're gonna see in the future that he doesn't turn down fights. Sigmund is a positive comparison to Beowulf, even if it has its own problematic parts, such as the nephew son. But Hermond here, well that's a distinctly negative comparison. Now, perhaps Hermond is meant to be a comparison of a bad king to Hrothgar as a good king, a person who ultimately accepted help, wasn't headstrong, and saved his people because of that. But we don't get Hrothgar immediately here. We have Beowulf. Hrothgar will come in again, and of course, comparison between kings is to be expected. But if Sigmund is being compared to Herod, Herod, that's a completely different person, is being compared to Hermund, and Beowulf is being compared to Sigmund. Well, what are we supposed to infer here? Of course, Hermund is meant to be somebody that Beowulf learns a lesson from and knows what to avoid. That's the important thing about stories. We know stories so that they can give us experiences we can't always have. But the problem is Beowulf is having these experiences. The comparison to Sigmund is meant to compliment him. It's not meant to teach him anything. 
So maybe that's why Hermann is here. We are supposed to learn something, so Beowulf should learn to avoid being a bad ruler and king just because he's made good achievements right now, especially in his youth. That's the question. How old is Beowulf? He mentioned that his swimming contest was back in his youth, and he's actually mentioned to be the oldest out of the group. Is Beowulf getting to the point where he should be settling down, getting married, and possibly thinking about kingship? Is this why that story's here? A warning to Beowulf that he should be taking a step back? If it is, I don't think he's learned the lesson immediately. It might be the placement of this event. He's too close to a victory to really think about being counseled right now, especially counseled in letting things go and putting his people before himself. Again, he goes on to reiterate his adventure in great detail of grappling with Grendel. Maybe Beowulf should be listening a little more. And in truth, the story is actually set in an interesting place. It almost seems to be that through the stories, Beowulf is supposed to be brought back into the community. That might take some explaining. The thing you always have to keep in mind, of course, is with heroes, they're always going to be a bit on the outside. They're the super strong, brave sometimes crazy types who can achieve things like monster slaying. But it usually means they're very, very different from those around them. Beowulf's already proven this. When he turned around and claimed that if any of them had been brave, they wouldn't be dealing with this problem, Beowulf precisely pointed out the fact that he doesn't belong to this community. He's separate from it, not because of his traveling from a different place, but because of his strength and his battle tactics. The fact is, Beowulf doesn't belong here, but he probably doesn't belong among the Gets either. There's probably a reason they sent him out. Heroes of war always end the war, but then they struggle to find a place in peace. That's why Odysseus ends up going back home and killing a whole lot of people. Beowulf is having that problem. He's suddenly far and above any of these people, but still has to exist among them. So maybe the story here is precisely to bring him back and resituate him within the community. He is not so singular that no one can accept him. He has people that he can be compared to. He has historic placement. Sigmund was this great hero, yes, but he was also a good king. So maybe we can bring Beowulf back in by showing him good kingship and bad kingship and saying, let's move you towards the one and not the other. The fact is that this is also the community telling this story. Beowulf is boasting of his own deeds in this part, but the community is saying, yes, but you're not so great as to exist on your own plane. There are other heroes before you, and they existed here as well. Maybe the community really is trying to poke a few holes in Beowulf before his head gets too big. Because ultimately, bad kingship is relatively easy to fall into. What could make a good hero isn't necessarily going to make a good king. You're going to have to think a lot more about your own people, and a lot less about yourself. Hermon doesn't seem to have been able to do that. Rothgar precisely can. He's not above thanking Beowulf for what he's done. He's not above thanking God, which, again, points to that problem between the paganism and Christian side, but we've discussed that already. Rothgar also tries to bring Beowulf 
back into the community by recognizing him to be like a son to him. It's still a higher placement than everybody else, but it also places Beowulf still below Rothgar. Rothgar is king. Beowulf is beholden to him. And to his uncle as well, who's king of the Gets. Ultimately, what we're seeing here is Beowulf achieving something great and then needing the community to bring him back down and back inside. And I say inside because I really do mean inside. Inside the hall, the hall where we're supposed to be civil. Where we've seen how that civility can be twisted. But the twisting of it also ultimately almost destroys the hall. We're actually told that the only thing undamaged is the roof. And needless to say, if the halls and pillars and walls go, well, the roof isn't going to be standing. And it's the community that fixes the hall, certainly not Beowulf. You get the feeling he's just sitting in a corner drinking, <laughs> saying, you should have seen it. Look at this hand. Look at this hand. But that side's needed, too. That's the careful thing you have to be aware of. We are walking a tightrope here. The hall needs to stand, but Grendel's arm still needs to be in here. Grendel's entire strength is represented in that arm. That's why he flees immediately and then dies at the loss of it. And it's also the symbol of fear that this hall has been through for 12 years. Fear of that arm reaching out and grabbing men and killing them. So that has to be displayed here to show that the fear has passed. The monster has been defeated. In fact, here is the hero who has defeated the monster. But all of that has to happen in the hall, and the hall has to come first before the recognition of the arm and the feasting and even the gifts. The people still have to come first. And heroes seem to have a problem recognizing that. And we readers, again, are meant to follow behind the hero and want to be like him. So we also have to be careful that we're not, well, breaking the hall down to make ourselves feel better. We are still meant to exist within a community, and if we have to walk the tightrope to do that, then we have to walk the tightrope to do that. There's a time for grappling with the monsters and ripping arms off. But that is not at the feast. That shouldn't even be in the hall. And that's certainly not done to your companions and friends. That's how you become a bad hero and a bad king. And like I said, Beowulf... Well, Beowulf makes a good hero. And we'll see if everything else comes from that. I'm going to keep reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.